Welcome to the New Books Network. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to New Books Network. I'm Galina Limorenko, doctoral candidate in neuroscience with a focus on biochemistry and molecular biology of neurodegenerative diseases at the PFL in Switzerland, and will be your host today. Today, we'll be talking to Will Kinney about the new book, An Infinity of Worlds, Cosmic Inflation and the Beginning of the Universe. What happened before the primordial fire of the Big Bang? a theory about the ultimate origin of the universe. Kinney considers the consequences of eternal cosmic inflation. Can we come to terms with the possibility that our entire observable universe is one of infinitely many, forever hidden from our view? Will, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, It's a pleasure to be here. So, how are you? How was your week? Oh, I've had a reasonably good week. Spring is here. I'm enjoying that. So, can you tell us a bit more about yourself? I am a professor in the Department of Physics at the State University of New York in Buffalo. Uh, And I work primarily on physics of the very early universe, uh, in particular inflationary cosmology, which is, uh, of course, what what my book is about, uh, An Infinity of Worlds. And how did you get interested in studying physics? I have been interested in physics and astronomy since I was a kid, really. Uh, one of the early inspirations for me was when I was very young watching uh, Apollo moon missions, the astronauts landing on the moon when I was a kid. So I sort of like shifted from wanting to be an astronaut to becoming interested in uh, astrophysics and uh, astronomy and astrophysics when I was in high school and uh, uh, then studied that in college and graduate school as well. So it's been a lifelong interest for me. Did you ever feel intimidated uh, with uh, such a grandeur? <laughs> Constantly, yes, <laughs> still do. <laughs> <laughs> that sort of comes with the territory. Uh, it's part of what's exciting about it, I think. And along your journey in your career, did you have any supporting uh, staff and mentors and your colleagues that really influenced you? I have had many mentors over my life, uh, and you know, I, I can't. It's hard to pick any one of them as someone standing out in particular, but all the way from teachers in high school who were very supportive of me. Um, I can think, for example, of a high school physics teacher who gave me a copy of um, uh, the book uh, uh, Good Lesher Bach and Eternal Golden Braid, almost as a challenge, right? I found that book incredibly difficult to read when I was young, but uh, it, super rewarding. Uh, and, you know, I, all the way through graduate school, my PhD advisor, uh, KT Mahantapo, is somebody who long supported me. And uh, 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 subsequently, people, for example, that uh, I worked with at Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory when I was a postdoc, working with uh, Brian Green at Columbia. I, I have had, I've been fortunate to have many, many people who have been uh, great teachers and great mentors and, and great supporters over the years and, and real inspirations. And what would you say to our students, our younger listeners, and also early career researchers? I think that, I mean, one thing that I often tell students is that what you're selected for in academia, what you're judged on and, and, and what uh, you're graded on and promoted on the basis of are the things that make you like other people, right? Being a good student, being good at taking tests, being good at uh, regurgitating things. And none of those things are really what's most useful to you as a researcher. What makes you valuable as a researcher is what makes you different from other people. So we have this sort of uh, disconnect in, in the way we train scientists, I think, and that we reward conformity, but we value nonconformity. And it's what makes you an individual. It's your unique perspective that makes you valuable as a scientist. And I try to get that, get that across to students when I talk to them. Oh, love it. So your latest book is An Infinity of Worlds, Cosmic Inflation and the Beginning of the Universe. So how did you come to writing it? This was a project that I did in collaboration with MIT Press, and uh, we realized that there was a need for a book on this subject because there are many, many sort of general pop science books out there, a lot of really good cosmology books. But uh, the last book that was written specifically about inflation in particular, which is a, a very important topic in early universe cosmology, the last book on the subject was one that was written by Alan Guth in the 1990s. And this was... Uh, This was a great book, and Guth was the person who really uh, arguably invented the theory. 
1980. So he was a perfect person to write it. But so much has happened since the mid 1990s and today in uh, in the field that it, we really felt that there was a need for a book that covered this particular topic in a lot of detail and really explained a modern perspective on how the theory works and what its implications are and how we fit it into the rest of physics. Well, let's delve into some of the science that you cover in your book. And we're going to start with the very basics. So can you tell us, how did our universe begin? Well, the standard picture of the early universe is, which most people have heard of, is called the Big Bang. And the Big Bang is the idea that the universe started out in a very hot, very dense, very smooth initial state. So the universe today is expanding. If you turn that, uh, if you turn time backwards and wind the clock backwards, what you find is that everything in the universe got closer and closer together at earlier times. And if you take simple physics, you take hydrogen gas, which is, is most of what the universe is made of, and compress it, it heats up. And so the early universe would have been a very, very hot cooker of a, a, a place where the, the relevant interactions in the extremely early universe, because the temperature would be so high, the particles would have so much energy that the physics that's relevant for that is particle physics, what we study at places like the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland. And this over the last century or so has been developed into a very detailed theory of how, for example, the primordial elements were formed and how the first galaxies uh, and stars condensed out of the primordial plasma. And so a standard history of the universe that has been created in this picture. But as successful as that has been, the hot Big Bang cosmology does not explain certain really key features of our universe, such as Why is it so big? Why is it so old? Why is the geometry of the universe so close to flat? We don't notice any curvature of the space that would bend light passing through it in anomalous ways. All of these things are uh, largely unexplained in the standard Big Bang model of cosmology. So the idea of inflation is an extension of this that essentially explains the initial conditions out of which this hot early universe arose. If you look at the Uh, equations for gravity that govern the evolution of the universe called uh, the Einstein field equations, which are part of Einstein's theory of gravity called general relativity. They tell you that the universe would have had a finite age. If you just put all the stuff that we know is in the universe into uh, into the equation, you run it backwards in time, what you find is that at initial time, the universe uh, arose out of what's called in gravity uh, a a singularity, a point at which the universe became so hot and so dense that all of our under, the laws of physics we understand break down. And in fact, that, and that would have happened at a finite time in the past, about 13.8 billion years ago, which we've measured now to an accuracy of uh, within a, an uncertainty of about 200 million years, which is a remarkable achievement. That singularity, that beginning of the universe that initiated the Big Bang, I think a lot of people have a misconception about it, that the Big Bang was sort of this explosion that happened somewhere in space, like there was some primordial seed that exploded and threw everything off in all different directions. And really nothing could be further from the truth. The Big Bang actually happened everywhere in an infinitely large space at once. It's a boundary in time, not a place in space. And that boundary in time is intrinsic to the the, the standard Big Bang model. Inflation is an idea that what we do is instead of having that the 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 initial conditions for the big bang arise out of a, a singular point is we uh put a period of very rapidly accelerating expansion on before that point so we replace that singularity at the start of the big bang with the end of this inflationary epoch and inflation was very different than the hot, dense, early universe of the Big Bang. In fact, it was cold and empty. So the universe prior to the onset of the the hot Big Bang would have been a cold, almost zero temperature universe filled with nothing but the energy of empty space itself. And that energy of empty space would have driven expansion at an incredibly rapid rate. So that a a volume equivalent to the size of our observable universe today during inflation would have started out about the size of a grapefruit and expanded to the size of our current universe in a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second. So a a truly remarkable idea. Uh, And furthermore, inflation makes a lot of specific predictions, and we can talk about that a little later probably, that we can test with astrophysical data. 
And so it's a, in that sense, it's a real scientific theory that we can go out and say, does our universe match the expectations we would have from this early period of super accelerated expansion that preceded the onset of the hot Big Bang universe? That is truly mind-bending. <laughs> so I was wondering, what is the age of the universe and to what precision do we know? Well, our universe, the one that we live in, the initial state, that initial hot universe, we can we can actually calculate its age very accurately. Uh, and that is the 13.8 billion years figures, plus or minus about 200 million. When we embed it in a larger inflationary space, our universe is one little pocket of a much larger structure, and that larger structure can be far older. So the question of how old is the universe is a little bit of a tricky one. Our universe, the 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 bubble of this larger inflationary universe that we live in is a little less than 14 billion years old. And we can measure that very accurately. This larger structure that is contained in the inflationary picture could be vastly older than that. And we have really no idea of its age uh, or, uh, uh, or its extent. So does this inflationary theory suggest that there are different universes? Inflation when you work out its consequences. So inflation was proposed to explain all of these basic properties of our own cosmos. But then when you write down a theory of, uh, of inflation that actually works, right, that explains all of these things, when you embed it into the context of a theory of uh, uh quantum particles and fields, right? So you, you create uh, models for this inflationary expansion using the language of particle theory. When you do that, what you find is that inflation makes a really stunning prediction, which is that once you get it started, it never really stops in a global sense. It always continues somewhere and that it only ends and creates a universe like ours in isolated places. And those places are, are pulled apart from each other faster than the speed of light. So inflation doesn't just predict the creation of our universe. It predicts the creation of an infinite number of other universes like ours that are all being pulled apart by the super accelerated expansion and can never intersect and can never, uh, can never measure each other's presence. So in fact, in the inflationary picture, our universe is but one of many, many, perhaps an infinite number that uh, are constantly being created in a process known as eternal self-reproduction. I probably got a bit of a silly question, <laughs> but was there a negative time, even in inflation theory? That's right. I mean, in, in, a, in a sense, time zero is still the beginning of the Big Bang in our little bubble of the universe. And inflation takes place in that negative time before that. Oh, wow. That's uh, fascinating. <laughs> so I was wondering... Can you just expand a little bit on the methods that you use to study all of these questions? Well, the, uh, the language that we write down specific theories for how this works, right? I mean, this is a great general idea, but you actually have to be able to calculate something, right? So you have to write it down in terms of a physical theory. And the physical theories we use are uh, the language of what's called quantum field theory, the language of particles and fields that is also applied, for example, to the standard model of particle physics that we test in particle accelerators. And using this language of field theory, you can actually study mathematically how these, uh, these universes would behave, these inflationary multiverses. So the, the work of the theorist, and most of what I do, is looking at realizing particular uh, realizations of these sort of inflationary cosmologies in specific models of particle physics, physics at extremely high energy, uh, energies that would be uh, somewhat less than the, the, the energy at which you would need to uh, understand the unification of quantum mechanics and gravity, but still about 100 billion times higher than the energies that we can test directly in particle accelerators like the Large Hadron Collider. On the other hand, in order to test these theories, you need to use astrophysics. And so inflation represents this meeting of inner space of particles and fields with the outer space of astrophysics and cosmology really at the very first moments of time. And Inflation makes specific astrophysical predictions. In particular, for example, you can look for signatures of this, echoes of this uh, incredibly early inflationary epoch. It leaves behind little echoes 
in, for example, the first the light left over from the Big Bang called the cosmic microwave background. The early universe would have been very hot and very dense. And when it it was about 400,000 years old, a little less, the universe would have gone from being opaque, like a thick fog that you couldn't see through, to being transparent. Temperature of the universe at that time was about 3,000 Kelvin, uh, you know, a little bit more than half the temperature of the surface of the sun. So that it, it, the universe, that primordial gas of the universe would have been glowing. It would, have, If you were there at the time, you would have actually seen the universe glow with this light from the hot gas surrounding you. That glow is still present in the universe, that leftover light, except it's been stretched to longer and longer wavelengths by the expansion of the universe and is now mostly in the microwave and it's called the cosmic microwave background. Tiny little fluctuations in the temperature of that cosmic microwave background actually are echoes from this inflationary epoch created by quantum mechanics. And by observing those echoes, we can actually test and rule out or, or, or confirm particular theories of how this early epoch would have worked. So does inflation help us reconcile the standard model of physics and quantum mechanics? It doesn't say anything particular for, uh, about the, the hard problem of unifying gravity in quantum mechanics, which is still an unsolved problem. This is something, for example, that string theorists are, uh, are working on and other alternatives such as loop quantum gravity. But it provides us with an arena by which we might test some of those ideas. Uh, and in particular, one of the things that happens during inflation is that the expansion is so great that it takes things of the size smaller than what's called the Planck length, the tiniest length possible in, uh, at which space itself would become quantized, and stretches those distances out to sizes comparable to our universe today. And there's hope that we might be able to see these echoes of quantum gravity left over in the echoes that were created by inflation itself. So far, there's been no particular evidence of this, but uh, uh, people are still looking and uh, it still remains a possibility. So because of the fact that inflation allows us, the, the physics allows us to probe scales at such incredibly high energies, much higher than we can do with any sort of particle physics. You can think of the universe as being like a particle accelerator, and we get to observe the outcome of that. We only have one shot at it, but nonetheless, that uh, there's a lot of information encoded in, for example, the cosmic microwave background or in the distribution of galaxies in the universe that are actually created during this early epoch of incredibly high energy. So we can use astrophysics to test particle physics at energies vastly beyond what we could do in a uh, in particle accelerator here on Earth, which so is a very exciting prospect. It's like a natural experiment, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's not one we can repeat unless we could create new universes, which we haven't been able to figure out how to do yet. But we mm. have the one. And uh, that gives us a, a remarkable amount of information about what, uh, what was happening at, uh, at physics at extraordinarily high energies. That was my, was my next question. Can, can we create a couple more universes? <laughs> uh, Alan Guth actually wrote some papers indicating that was, it was in principle possible to do in the lab. Uh, so that you could you could create new universes in the laboratory if you had the correct conditions, but it would require technology that is vastly beyond anything that we'd be capable of right now. So at the moment, it remains a purely theoretical prospect. So how did researchers arrive to this uh, theory of inflation? This... Uh, it resulted in a lot of uh, uh, thinking in the 1970s and 1980s. And in particular, Guth proposed uh, the theory of inflation in a very famous paper in 1980. But there were a lot of people who were thinking along the same lines at the time. And it was realizing, uh, physicists were starting to realize that the physics that is responsible for the Higgs boson in the standard model of particle physics, which was recently discovered at the Large Hadron Collider a few years ago, that the physics of the Higgs boson also carried with it a uh, result that you could have that, that these things called scalar fields like the Higgs could create energy density in empty space, right? So the, the basic physics that inflation relies on to do its magic is that you have to have uh, purely empty space, complete vacuum would actually carry energy with it. And furthermore, that energy has to change with time. It has to be dynamical because a universe that's purely full of vacuum energy would just expand rapidly forever and never, and never heat up and never turn into a universe that look like, looks like ours. So the two requirements for this theory 
are that you have to have uh, an energy associated with empty space, and that energy has to be dynamical. And it turns out that particles or fields like the Higgs are a perfect candidate for creating this kind of time-dependent vacuum energy that you need to implement inflation. And so when people were thinking about this in the 1970s and uh, early 1980s, uh, it was realized that this uh, postulating that the early universe could be filled with this kind of vacuum energy created by a field like the Higgs could solve all kinds of outstanding problems that they didn't understand about cosmology in the first place. So it was sort of in the zeitgeist, but Guth was the first person to really put all the pieces together. And it was his paper that ultimately ended up being the most influential and the one that got cited the most as being sort of the origin of the theory. Was there any backlash to this uh, theory at the time? Uh, a lot of people thought it, uh, it was didn't have a lot of credibility, right? So that this was a very radical idea. It took people a while to accept it. Um, and even as recently as when, when I started working on it, on, uh, when I was a graduate student working on my PhD in the, in the 1990s, it was one of a number of competing theories. Uh, and... Uh, a lot of those com competing theories have since fallen by the wayside, but not all of them. For example, there are people who prefer uh, models of cosmology that involve a, a, a bounce where the universe starts in a contracting phase, goes through a bounce where it changes direction, and then re-expands again. And so physicists uh, such as Paul Steinhardt at Princeton have been championing an alternative to inflation that uh, uh, involves bouncing cosmologies or even cyclic ones where you it, it bounces an infinite number of times where you go through, you expand, you recontract, you go through a big crunch, you re-expand again. And the idea is to construct cosmologies that exist forever in this oscillating state. So this is the alternative that people consider today. So how does this theory deal with stuff like dark matter, for example, and dark energy? Well, inflation uh, is, in a sense, driven by a kind of dark energy. So mm. the dark energy that is in our universe today that is making the expansion speed up, we see this in uh, astrophysical evidence, for example, observations of distant supernovae. That also corresponds to something that at least acts like an energy of empty space, the same kind of energy that drove inflation. The difference between the dark energy today and inflation in the early universe is that the energy density of the vacuum during inflation would have been many, many, many orders of magnitude higher than the energy density in the vacuum today. We don't understand why there are, is such a difference between the two epochs or why the vacuum energy in the universe today even exists. It's not well understood. Inflation has less to say directly about dark matter, although there are versions of it in which you can, for example, create particular species of dark matter and so on. Inflation just demands that the universe have exactly the right energy density so that the geometry is flat. Uh, dark matter forms a part of that in our universe, uh, but it's, it's less directly related to the physics of inflation itself. But dark energy is, in a sense, inflation, just happening at late time. So what kind of things can this theory predict? Well, the big thing is, aside from sort of answering these big questions, why is the universe so big, why is it so old, and so on, is when you write down a theory for inflation that explains all of these gross properties of the universe, you get something else for free. That's because when you put in quantum mechanics, what you find is that quantum mechanics tells you that you will generate not a perfectly smooth and homogeneous universe, but because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, there will be little inhomogeneities because of quantum uncertainty. And these get carried along in the space-time created by inflation, can get carried along for the ride, and they get stuck in the basically as uh, variations in the density of the matter in the universe. And it is, in fact, these quantum echoes that allow us to observe the consequences of inflation and actually test our theories. So when you take this theory that was originally intended to explain, you know, sort of very large scale properties of the cosmos and you look at it in detail, you find that quantum mechanics gives you a mechanism for creating the initial little fluctuations in the density of the universe. And it's these fluctuations that collapse under gravity to form galaxies and clusters of galaxies and stars and people and everything else is that the, all of these things, all these little initial 
fluctuations in the in the uh, early matter in the universe that collapsed to form all the structure we see today had their origin in quantum mechanics operating on this early inflationary expansion. So it's a beautiful picture in that you, for free, you get all of the structure in the universe. And furthermore, inf inflation makes very, predic very particular predictions about how that structure works. So inflation makes a, a very definite set of statistical predictions about how those perturbations ought to look like. And you can go and test those predictions and inflation passes with flying colors. The, the actual fluctuations we see in the universe that lead to structure match exactly what you would expect from the inflationary theory. So it's a great success in that sense. You're doing real science. This is not philosophy. You're actually making testable predictions, going out and testing them. And do we have the ability to uh, do these kind of cal calculations or do we need to improve our computational uh, um, approaches? Uh, the uh, actual inflationary theory is something that is, uh, you don't even really need numerics to do it. You can do a lot of the calculations analytically, although some, some parts of it get difficult enough that you need to apply computers to it. But the basic idea of the theory is incredibly simple. And the physics is uncomplicated, and this is one of its strengths, is that it's, uh, you can really do meaningful calculations of how all of this would work and how the, the very early universe would be put together. And one of the things I do for my bread and butter as a physicist is I live in the, uh, the space in between the theorists and the experimentalists where... Uh, taking, for example, models of string theory or uh, other models of extremely high energy, translating them into particular models of the early universe and then calculating uh, what their observable consequences ought to be uh, is uh, something that's a thriving field right now. And that's one of the things that I do you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. So is the Big Bang theory and the theory of inflation, are, uh, are they completely contradicting its, uh, each other or can there be like two facets of the same reality? Oh, they're quite complementary. There's no contradiction mm. there at all. It's just that the inflationary picture extends and expands the picture of the Big Bang itself. So it doesn't, we're not overthrowing the idea of the Big Bang. It's still there. It still works exactly as, as it has before. But now instead of just saying, well, we don't know what happens at time zero, Inflation is an extension of this that allows us to contextualize the, the, the Big Bang itself in, in, in a larger picture. So it's not a replacement for the Big Bang. It's an extension of it that explains things that were previously unexplained. So is it mostly applied to this early universe or can it be applied to current universe and then future universe as well? Well, in the sense of applying it to the current universe, it explains all of the things that we see. So the tests that we, the experimental tests that we do are very much rooted in uh, modern precision cosmology and astrophysics. And that's where a lot of the work is being done. Inflation, on the other hand, in, in the larger sense, changes very fundamentally our picture of the structure of the cosmos as a whole. Our infinite universe that came into being all at once at the moment of the Big Bang in the inflationary picture is just one of many. And each, they are all being continuously created uh, uh, in an infinite process of self-reproduction going forward. So in that sense, it, it really changes our, our, our global picture of our place in the cosmos altogether. Not only are we just one small planet you know, am among many in one galaxy that is many galaxies uh, in, the, in our observable universe, our observable universe is a small piece of a larger more, uh, universe that, we, that uh, exists beyond our ability to see. And that universe itself, that infinite universe that we live in, is but one of many in this even larger structure. And so we are very small indeed, if you think of it that way, is that uh, uh, we, are, we are but one small piece of one small piece of an infinite number of uh, unimaginably large pieces extending outward uh, further than, uh, than, than we can access but because of fundamental limits of causality. I'm absolutely thrilled that there can be other universes in this uh, sort of huge picture. So I was wondering, will the physics of those universes be similar to what we have here, or can they be completely exotic? We don't know, uh, is the short answer. And this is the subject of a lot of, uh, a lot of controversy and debate in the field. If you look at this 
multiverse picture in the context of fundamental theories of physics like string theory. In particular, string theory is a nice uh, illustrative example of this. What you find is that in a stringy picture, that uh, the universe, the, in, in, in particular, string theory doesn't predict uniquely uh, the laws of physics that we see in our universe, but predicts many, many different varieties of, uh, of ways that you might construct universes with different laws of physics. Most of them would be incompatible with the existence of life, or at least life that we know it. So the picture in string theory is of a universe that is basically a, this enormous structure, these, uh, these many, many universes being popped out of this, this uh, uh, exponential expansion. Almost all of them would be mute, empty, and lifeless. And we happen to live in this unbelievably lucky little oasis uh, that is selected for us. Essentially, uh, uh, this is a, an idea called the anthropic principle, that we live in the universe we live in, not because this universe is typical in any way, but in fact, the opposite, because it's special. And it's special because it's compatible with the existence of us in the first place. So this idea of the anthropic principle that arises uh, uh, out of string theory is that our universe is really special and it's special because of the fact that it accommodates our own existence. And so it ties our presence in the universe to the overall structure of the laws of physics themselves. This is an extremely controversial idea and, and I'm very critical of it in the book. The alternative perspective and the one I think that I favor is to take a lesson from Nicholas Copernicus who was the first pro to propose the idea that the earth is in a sense ordinary, right? That the earth is not the center of the universe and the Ptolemaic cosmology that was, uh, that, that preceded uh, the Copernican picture of the universe for more than 1500 years, the earth had a special, a privileged position in the universe. We were at the center of the cosmos. Everything was really here because of us in a mm -hmm. sense. And Copernicus demolished that universe and, and demoted the earth to an ordinary place in the universe. And this was taken even further by the Renaissance philosopher Giordano Bruno, who, was, who took Copernicus's ideas even much further than Copernicus did. And in particular, Copernicus realized that if the earth wasn't special, that means it should be one of many perhaps an infinite number of other worlds like our own. And he wrote in 1584, Bruno wrote, God is infinite, so his universe must be two. He is glorified not in one, but in countless suns, not in a single earth, a single world, but in a thousand thousand, I say in an infinity of worlds, which of course is where the title of the book is from, as it's a reference to Giordano Bruno. Bruno had a Copernican viewpoint on the universe that the very organizing principle that, that made the cosmology hang together was that the earth was ordinary. And by extension, so were we. And so I think the, I, I think a viewpoint of the inflationary multiverse that is, is one that I favor is extending that Bruno's idea of an infinity of worlds, not just to an infinity of worlds like earth, but to an infinity of universes like our own. So we are but one of many and, uh, it only makes sense the, the the this picture of this infinite self-reproducing universe can be understood philosophically from a Copernican viewpoint in that uh, we are just one of many who are uh, you know different in detail but alike in uh, in type in the same way that other planets might have very different life than our own but we would all be have a certain kinship that there would be similar underlying principles that would apply no matter what. This is basically a, the, over, the uh, universality of physical law written in a, in a geometric way, right? So one of the basic principles that underlies all scientific inquiry is the idea that physical laws in our universe are truly universal. They don't vary from place to place. Because if they did, there would be no way to ex extrapolate our understanding from our local environment out to the larger universe as a whole. And... Of course, we can. The laws of physics here and the laws of physics on the other side of the cosmos, as far as we know, are the same. I don't see any reason to expect that those laws of physics would be different in different universes in this inflationary multiverse as well. So when you try and visualize sort of this universe and other universes, what do you picture? Is it like a big bubble or how, how does it appear to you? Well, the analogy that I use uh, in the book is that the inflationary multiverse is something like a, a glass of beer, 
except it extends infinitely, but aside from that. And so in that glass of beer, you have lots of little bubbles that are forming because of uh, condensations of gas, right? So the inflationary multiverse is a lot like that glass of beer in that the the space in between the bubbles is this exponentially expanding space, zero temperature dominated by the energy of empty space. And inside each bubble is a universe. And one of the neat things about general relativity, about Einstein's theory of gravity, is that this bubble, which looks, if you were an observer on the outside, it would look like a little finite spherical patch that was expanding in size outward at the speed of light in this case. But to an observer inside that finite bubble, it appears to be a spatially infinite universe. The bubble wall itself is a moment in our past, which would be the moment at which the Big Bang happened in our particular local universe. That's an excellent analogy. It really helps me um, sort of visualize how, how it could look like. So looking now on the flip side, what, what things this theory cannot address? Well, one of the questions that immediately arises is if inflation replaces the beginning of the universe with this exponential expansion, does it get rid of that initial singularity, that point at which we can't, under our laws of physics break down and time itself ceases to exist, right? Because that's a feature of the standard Big Bang model. So if we take away that initial singularity and replace it with a, a period of inflationary expansion that takes place before that, can we get rid of the initial singularity altogether? Can we create a universe that is seamlessly understood, although infinitely far back in time as well as infinitely far forward into the future? And the answer to this, remarkably, is no. Hmm. So um, physicists uh, Arvind Borde, uh, Alan Guth, and Alexander Vilenkin in 2002 proved a mathematical theorem applied to inf any inflationary cosmology that says it actually has to be finite into the past. You can make the universe really, really, really old, quadrillions of years, quadrillions of quadrillions of years if you wanted, but it nonetheless always must have a beginning. And this is rooted in what are called singularity theorems that go back as far as Roger Penrose and Stephen Hawking in the 1960s, showing that in general in Einstein's theory of gravity, that uh, space times that obey certain general properties, which we believe to be true, had to arise out of initial singularities inevitably. So the bizarre result that you get is that this incredible, infinitely expanding inflationary multiverse that we are presumably a tiny part of still must have had a finite age at some finite time in the past. And so we have not removed the problem of the initial singularity, of this place where space and time themselves cease to exist. We've just pushed it far, far into this murky past of the inflationary universe where all trace of its nature have been diluted away by this in, uh, the exponential expansion of inflation itself. So how do you envision the future of physics? Boy, that's a hard question. I don't know. <laughs> uh, it, it's impossible to predict exactly how people are going to uh, cope with a lot of the problems that we're seeing. You know, the fact that we only understand what 4% of the universe is, right? The hydrogen and helium, all the matter that makes us up and everything that we see, we now know based on indirect evidence that that only accounts for about 4% of the total energy of the universe. The other 96% is in dark matter and dark energy, and we have no idea what these things are. I think it's, it's reasonable to believe that we will come to a good understanding of the nature of dark matter within the next 20 years or so. I'm less optimistic about an understanding of the nature of dark energy, which is a much harder problem. Uh, but aside from that, I mean, the, the world is full of surprises. And some young person out there is going to come and revolutionize our understanding of all of this, I think. And it's impossible to tell when it will be or who it is. Uh, but I certainly hope I'm around to see it. And what questions still keep you up at night? <laughs> I, uh, you know, I am really interested in completing this picture of the composition of the universe. Uh, and I think that precision cosmology going forward, you know, uh, so the, the, the theoretical uh, landscape is, is highly uncertain, I think. But the experimental landscape is really thrilling because in the next 20 years or so, we're going to really make a bunch of uh, measurements of things like the 
uh, positions of galaxies in the universe, the, uh, uh, the evolution of structure, the observations of when the first galaxies and the first stars formed, searches for dark matter, all of these things are ongoing now. And this e era of high precision cosmology that started out in the early 21st century and is, uh, is still going on now. And, I, and I'm very bullish on that. I think it's going to continue. And I think the things that we're going to learn, the, the precision picture of the universe that is going to come out of that is, is really a thrilling thing. And it's, it's, it's really a remarkable thing to be a part of. So now thinking about the bigger picture, I mean, it can't really get any bigger than the multi-universe <laughs> overall, but... Why is it important for our society to really think about these problems and invest in this kind of research? Well, I think that these are questions that human beings have been asking as long as human beings have been human beings. I, I think it's just a part of our makeup that we want to understand what our picture, what our position is, what our relationship is to the world that we live in. It's an innate human thing. It's important to us, and it's always been important to us. And I think this kind of work is worth socially supporting for that reason in and of itself. Certainly, there are technological spin-offs that come from, for example, studying particle physics. One of the, you know, one of the technology spin-offs from astrophysics that everybody is, is familiar with is the CCDs that you use in a cell phone camera, right? Those were first developed to do astronomy. They were sensors for astronomical telescopes, and the people who did most of the technology development for that were astronomers. But now everyone has these incredible CCD cameras in their phones. The consumer applications of this has been huge. But that's not why we do science. We do science because we're curious, and we want to under understand our place in the world. And I think that's really what drives, certainly drives me, and I think this is why this kind of subject is interesting to the general public as well. I think people are interested in it because they want to see what their own place in the universe is. And what discoveries during your writing of your book, An Infinity of Worlds, surprised you the most? Well, I think when I started writing the book, I didn't really have fully formed this viewpoint of placing it within uh, a Copernican picture of the cosmos, really applying the Copernican principle or its extension called the cosmological principle that, you know, our universe is that, you know, our place, there is no special place in the universe. There are no special observers. There is no, uh, uh, everything is, you know, pretty much the same everywhere. This idea of an organizing principle of cosmology based on uh, the Copernican idea of our ordinariness Really situating the inflationary multiverse inside a similar picture was something that really developed uh, in my mind while we were, while I was writing the book itself, and 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 it certainly became almost the central theme of the book by the end of it. So what started out as I, I like to say that my editor uh, asked me for a forty thousand word explainer on inflation, and he got a forty seven thousand word manifesto on Copernicanism instead, and. Mm. Uh, uh, to his credit, he was he was very good about that and uh, recognized the potential. But so the book started out being one thing, and it certainly is that. But it ended up being a bigger thing, which is really looking at how we philosophically cope with this picture of our universe being just one of many. So, given that it's a possibility to have so many universes, so then the cartoon Rick and Morty is it like a documentary then? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for not asking me about the Marvel universe. I, <laughs> I, the difference, of course, is that we can't travel to these places, even in principle. Uh, and, and one way to think of this is that, that all of those other universes, right, they're not out there somewhere in space. They are actually all in our past, right? The, the, the edge of our inflationary bubble is in our past, because of the way we folded our, our infinite universe up into this finite bubble. And so in order to visit any of these places, we would actually have to be able to travel in time to before the beginning of our own universe. And we certainly don't know how to do that now. Uh, and it's very likely that uh, we'll never figure out how to do it. Although uh, never say never, right? It's possible we could uh, uh, realize that we could come up with an extension of our laws of physics that would, that would enable us to do something like that. But it's certainly a very far-fetched possibility. 
Oh, there goes my wish to travel to the so, universe of Sticky Grandmas. Yeah, uh, no, no, no quick 20-minute adventures in and out, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been truly mind-blowing discussion. So can you tell us what are you currently working on and what will be your next project? That's a good question. I haven't settled that down much. I mean, one, one idea that uh, I've been talking about with a, with a couple of publishers is uh, uh, actually doing a textbook on inflation itself, so something that is intended for a technical audience rather than a popular audience. But uh, I can certainly see uh, uh, writing another popular book as well, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, but I'm going to play my ideas on that one close to the chest at the moment, if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> And what would be the best way for our listeners to find more information about your work and also your book? Well, the book is being distributed globally, so you can get it on any of your favorite uh, 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 online book sites, you know, uh, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, uh, uh, European equivalents. You can also pick it up at uh, your local bookshop as well, so it, uh, uh, it's out in bookstores uh, pretty much everywhere on the planet at the moment. Uh, so, and... Uh, 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 I have also been, of course, doing a, a number of podcasts like yours, and uh, uh, hopefully we'll be doing some more of those as well, you know, so getting the word out about the book. And uh, I hope people have a look at it and, uh, and find it uh, useful and informative. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you very much for having me. This has been a great pleasure. I've enjoyed talking with you.